glasses. I can't see without my glasses. Welcome to another episode of the Unmasked History of Scooby-Doo, the podcast where we delve into the mystery of Scooby-Doo media, getting clues from people who helped bring our favorite mystery-solving dog to life on various platforms, and maybe eating some Scooby snacks along the way. I'm your host, Alexa Lawler. Scooby-Doo, where are you? And it would have been mine if it hadn't been to those meddling kids. Gang, we've just been handed our next mystery. Blasted meddling kids. (laughs) On this week's episode, I spoke with Christopher Keenan former Senior Vice President of Creative Affairs for Warner Brothers. Christopher was involved in the early direct-to-video movies from Cyber Chase to Chill Out Scooby-Doo, and was also involved in the What's New Scooby-Doo series. But I'll let Christopher go into the specifics of his role in the interview. Additionally, somewhere along the way, with both the joys of technology and construction, There ended up being a couple of technical issues on the audio, so bear with me for this one. I did my best to fix it up as much as I could, but it is still quite noticeable in places, unfortunately. However, I still think it's a good interview to hear, and Christopher had a lot of interesting things to say about Scooby, so here it is. And if the sound issues are a little bit too much for you and you might have missed what Christopher said, you can find a transcript of the interview on the podcast's website at unmaskedsdpodcast.com. But without further ado, here is my interview with Christopher Keenan. Hi, Christopher. Thanks so much for chatting with me today. Well, thank you. I'm really pleased to be here. Now, if you're game, I typically start off with a quick three-question trivia game. Oh, okay. So question one, uh, true or false, when What's New Scooby-Doo premiered, it put an end to an 11-year break of having no new Scooby-Doo television series. True. That is correct. It is true. And question two. Uh, what was the very first movie to kick off the series of direct-to-video Scooby-Doo movies that still continues today? That would be Scooby-Doo and the Witch's Ghost. It's actually Zombie Island. Zombie Island was the first one. Oh, oh, sorry. Oh, don't can we can we redo it and let me get it right? <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, yes, you're absolutely right. It's Zombie Island. Witch's Ghost was after. My bad. <laughs> no problem. Uh, And last question for the trivia game. In the majority of the various different versions of Scooby-Doo, which character of the gang does not have a catchphrase? Oh, excellent question. I would say Fred. That is correct. And to start off the general questions, what's your relationship to Scooby-Doo? Did you watch it all? I actually have a very long history with Scooby-Doo. I watched the show every Saturday morning in the 1970s. I was a huge fan. And so I was really thrilled when I was able to be involved with um, the animation at Warner Brothers when Pat Barbera became part of Warner Brothers under Turner. And do you have a favorite personal memory related to Scooby-Doo? Probably my favorite personal memory was when we pitched What's New Scooby-Doo to the Kids WB Network as a series. My pitch was very, very simple. I literally said, it's Scooby-Doo the way you think you remember it. It's funny, it's scary, and all the mysteries make sense. And they bought it. Awesome. And how did you come to work in animation? You know, I actually started working in animation at Warner Brothers as a receptionist. I had been working in a now-defunct company called New World Entertainment, which was a film and television company. 
as a receptionist and uh, someone there was married to someone at Warner Brothers who said, hey, they have a much better benefit plan and they're starting an animation division, you should go over there. I hadn't ever thought of a career in animation, although I was definitely clear I wanted to work in children's television. I studied you know, communications, theater, and education, and I was looking for a way to bring everything together, and animation became, became the conduit to that. And for those that maybe don't know, can you describe what your role was on Scooby-Doo? Sure. My role on Scooby-Doo um, was a bit of a uh, catch-all role in that as head of the creative department at Warner Brothers Animation, I oversaw the initiation of um, the development of various Scooby projects, uh, particularly long-form direct-consumer movies, as well as television series. And I would bring together the creative teams, um, which would include writers and directors and designers and producers. And then I would oversee all aspects of the creative throughout the whole process. And in addition, since we didn't have um, a separate sales team, also pitch and sell the concepts internally to our home video division and to or a broadcaster who at the time was KCB. I was definitely um, intimately involved with every step of everything, but really the first two videos, um, and continued doing that for about 15 years. And can you describe the process of development from start to finish for a Scooby-Doo movie? Sure. The development process for a Scooby-Doo movie was, um, was unique in that we would always look at Two things. One, where have we been before and where would it be exciting to take Scooby? And by that, I mean everything from the mystery itself and what's at stake, as well as the setting and uh, location in terms of what would be visually interesting and provide the most fodder for you know, comedic and or spooky fodder. I was lucky enough to work with a couple of different really talented producers, directors, and writers, and it would be very much a collaborative effort. Um, sometimes it would start as simply as saying, wouldn't it be great if Scooby met the Loch Ness Monster? And we would take it from there, or it would be trying to figure out, you know, different ways of introducing specific arenas that or, or specific um, settings that could be really, really fun for Scooby. Scooby and the whole gang. From that concept, we would um, go right into sort of mapping out a story. And as most people um, may not know, but it's tricky in children's content to come up with crimes that are kid friendly. So you end up with a lot of theft and a lot of deceit um, because crimes of passion or anything particularly violent is, is off limits. Um, so there's a lot of deceit and a lot of theft in Scooby Doo. Uh, adventures. Um, and that would be, you know, once we decided on the setting and or the, the creature or monster or um, spookiness that Scooby was going to encounter, um, we would then focus on the mystery itself. What's at stake? What is it that someone's trying to get away with that the, that the team can, um, a mystery they can unravel? Um, and then we would plot it out like any other movie, you know, with, with lots of story beats up on the wall and make sure the story all sort of makes sense. Um, and when I say it on the wall so that we can visually see it, visually see where the high point of the action is, where the resolution is, really just looking at it from a visual standpoint to make sure it's a satisfying structure. Um, and then our writers would dive in and bring it to life with lots of um, very character specific sort of runners and, and mini stories within the larger story. Um, and it would be at that point when we actually had a full story with some detail that we would be presenting or pitching it, sometimes with visual reference or a mood board that would show the setting. Um, and once we got buy off from our internal partners, we would go you know, full speed into production. Um, one of the great things about producing those Scooby films, though, is that we were constantly making adjustments as we went, as, as the story went from script to storyboard and from storyboard to animatic and layout and and we would always be trying to increase um two things one was the humor and the other was the sort of thrills and chills and how different would that process be when it comes to a series 
Um, the difference between doing a long form film and doing a series really is one of timing. Um, with a series, uh, there's a, a production schedule that really necessitates having multiple scripts in play at one time and very specific steps on those scripts um, being met uh, in terms of the production schedule. Um, so there's not a lot of time to kind of, you know, noodle an idea at premise. It goes, once a premise is approved, it goes right to outline, right to script and the storyboard. But we don't have the luxury of, of kind of sitting around and, and mulling over possibilities. It, uh, the production of a series is much more a, a well-oiled machine and you have to feed the machine and keep things um, moving at a pace. We, we always worked on what we call a waterfall schedule, where if you looked at the schedule visu visually and you were looking at the timing across the top and the episodes down the side, you would see how multiple episodes are in multiple steps at, at the same time, including the writing. Um, you know, there'd be anywhere from you know, four to six scripts all in process at the same time. And for a Scooby project, would you generally have uh, like the same creative team on staff or would you ever bring in people on freelance? So while each Scooby production was unique, um, we did use a number of uh, production personnel and and creative people um, from one project to the next. So for example, um, Scott Geralds was an enormously talented director who uh, produced the first couple of Scooby-Doo long form videos that I worked on. Um, and then we uh, hired, when we sold What's New Scooby-Doo, we hired a trio of, of uh, head writers slash story editors who worked on the series and would hire freelance writers. But that creative team oversaw the writing on the series. And we brought in a, a new producer for the series as Scott was busy working on some of the videos. Um, and then we also worked with uh, another uh, producer um, later on in some of the latter videos, um, or long forms named Jeff Sitka. Jeff Sheets was our producer on the series. Uh, Marge Dean was another producer on both the series and the long form. We had a lot of people who were um, uh, sort of full-time Warner Brothers people, as well as freelancers who would come and go. We just really always wanted to assemble the right talent for the right project. And would the ideas for the movies and the episodes come from within that creative team, or would you ever have, you know, outside people pitching ideas? You know, the ideas came from a variety of sources. Often they would come from the creative team. Sometimes they would come from me. Sometimes they would come from outside sources, writers who would come in and pitch a specific idea. Um, it, it was definitely a collaborative effort, regardless of where the, the initial idea came from, because there would be so many people who would touch it throughout the process and everybody would, would add something to it, whether they were in an official creative capacity or not. Um, it, was, it was definitely an enthusiastic team who you know, had no... Everyone, no one was shy about tossing their ideas into the room. The best ideas would always win. And in the development of a Scooby-Doo movie or in the series, what are some aspects that the project absolutely needed to have? That's an excellent question. Um, number one, I think what was really critical was for every project to truly showcase or bring to life the different aspects of the different members of the, the mystery gang. You know, the, the Scooby gang itself, if you sort of think of them as one entity, they each sort of represent a different side of humanity. And you can almost put them together and make, you know, one character because you've got the heart, the brains, the, um, the imagination, uh, the vanity, you've got it all on um, each of those characters. And so anytime we did anything, whether it was an episode of the show or a long form um, movie, it was really important that we serviced each of those characters in, in, a, in a satisfying way. Um, it couldn't just be the Scooby and Shaggy show, but that was, you know, everyone's temptation because they were so much fun, so visual, so, so comedic. Um, but Fred, Velma, and Daphne really evolved over the years as being very specific personalities with very specific um, voices, if you will. 
Um, and I mean that in the broadest sense, not vocally necessarily. Um, but we wanted to make sure that we were serving them as well as the mystery, as well as the setting, as well as, you know, Scooby and Shaggy's antics. Um, that was probably number one. Number two, we always wanted the mystery to make sense. As I said, that was our pitch for the series, but we wanted the viewer, we wanted to be true to the mystery genre, i.e. we wanted to make sure that we were planting clues, that, that the audience was able to try and solve the mystery along with the gang. Um, we didn't want to introduce a character in the final reel and say, oh, it was crazy Mr. Jones, who we've never met before. You know, We wanted to make sure that the pieces and parts were there, that if you went back and watched it again, you could, you could see how um, the mystery actually unfolded. Um, there were times we were more successful with that than others, where other, you know, sometimes it was a bit of a stretch, um, but still fun along the way. Um, and then the third thing, and probably number one, every Scooby adventure needed to be, first and foremost, it needed to be fun. It needed to be a rollicking good time. More like being in a, you know, an amusement park haunted house than you know, watching a scary movie. We were never about, you know, trying to um, make animated horror. We were much more about trying to, you know, it happened to have a spooky twist. And you mentioned having to have uh, most of the motives be kid friendly, but uh, how were you, how were you working to make sure that, you know, kids would love it, but also adults would be able to watch it and not be upset when their kid wanted to watch it, you know, 50 times in a row. Right. Um, it's, it's, it's a bit of a, a balancing act. I mean, we wanted to make sure that the mysteries were intelligent enough that parents and, and older audience members weren't going to just be rolling their eyes. But at the same time, as I said, it, when you start getting into crime and looking at crime and all the different kind of genres of crime or areas of crime, most of them are not particularly kid friendly and weren't things that we were going to do in animation. Um, we also wanted to be sure that there was always the revelation in the end that, um, that, that, you know, ghosts are not real, that not, that all of the spooks and scares were not real. Um, sometimes we would leave a little element of, um, mystery where, you know, but could it have been, you know, sort of a question mark, but the mystery that they're actually solving does get solved in a satisfying way. So that we're not just leaving it open and that, you know, yes, by the way, werewolves are real. You know, um, we felt that was really important to the, to the younger audience. Um, there were a couple of films early on that did um, put forth the idea that the, the monsters are real. Um, I know that's come up in other Scooby content, but the series that I worked on, the two series and the majority of the, of the films all would conclude with um, a, a revelation at the end that uh, proved that it was a hoax or it was a, um, a misleading event and wasn't uh, based on you know anything evil being afoot um, in reality. Although, as I say, we did lose use a couple of of sort of um, question mark moments where. For example, at the end of Scooby-Doo and Loch Ness Monster, even though they've solved the mystery, at just before we go to credits, you see a fin and a, a sort of water swirl of some kind, which at least leaves the question open and whether there is still something in the lock. And where did the idea come from to kind of have that ambiguity in some of them? You know, it came from a couple of places. Um, we... In looking at the original, um, the original Scooby-Doo, mysteries were always tied up neatly and there was never anything saying that the monsters were real. The first couple of um, Scooby-Doo films that were done before I was involved definitely put forward that the monsters were real and it was sort of a new take on Scooby-Doo. We decided with the subsequent films and then the series that it was important, particularly with the television audience that we, you know, the younger television audience, since our audience was six to 11 year olds, that we make it clear that, that monsters are not real. However, 
there are some things that are unanswered in the real world that we decided were worth um, giving a nod to. So whether it was aliens or the Loch Ness Monster or anything that there happened to be a little bit of ambiguity or uncertainty in the real world, we felt like it was fair game to say, but you never know. Um, but if it was, you know, vampires or witches or anything like that in the films or s series I worked on, we would conclude with a revelation that said, you really don't have anything to be worried about. Okay. Uh, and is there one that's maybe easier to develop between a movie or a series? Um, they, they each present unique opportunities and challenges. The, the, the satisfaction of developing and producing a film is that it is a single story. And in terms of its scope and its breadth, you can tell um, a much bigger story that can have, you know, a main plot and subplots and, and sort of comedic runners throughout it. And you really focus on a beginning, middle and an end. And um, that may sound really obvious, but it becomes a very finite thing and it's satisfying have those parameters and the time to actually explore them fully. Um, on the flip side, um, the great thing about a series is you have an opportunity to tell many different stories, but you don't have, as I said earlier, the luxury of time to go deeply into any one story. Um, and the stories are so quick that you know, it's hard to service much more than uh, a main story um, and uh, in a single episode. And the challenge with the series, especially as you get into a second and third season, is coming up with all of those stories and not feeling like you're repeating yourself or not feeling like, you know, you've already been down this path. That, that's one of the biggest challenges on a series. And were there any challenges in working on a Scooby-Doo project specifically? Um, well, going back to going back to the crimes themselves, um, generally, in every Scooby-Doo story, there is a culprit or a villain who is behind the mystery, and their motivations for doing whatever they're doing almost always kept, came back to greed or jealousy. It was hard to, as I said earlier, it was hard to tell any stories that were really crimes of passion or because someone was a sociopath, you know, we couldn't go there. So there... After a while, the pattern of somebody being greedy, whether it's stealing or trying to swindle someone um, or being jealous, um, that was a challenge to continue to come up with new ways to explore those themes that would lead to crimes and then lead to the mysteries. Both the series of movies that you had worked on and What's New Scooby-Doo were uh, in a way, a revival for the Scooby-Doo franchise. What was it like to work on that? For me, working on it was an enormous pleasure and an enormous honor. As I said, I was a huge fan as a kid. Um, working on it for so long, I also felt like I got sort of Scooby in my blood. Um, I had a lot of passion for the individual characters themselves. You know, when I looked back at the original, I, I remember loving... Um, the characters for different reasons. And I wasn't seeing as much evidence in the original of, of the very qualities that I thought I loved about them. Um, and I wanted to work with the team to really bring those out. Um, so for example, you know, Velma, um, you know, obviously everyone knows Velma's incredibly intelligent and well-read, um, but I had remembered her as having a very wry sense of humor and um, a little bit sarcastic and really affectionate towards the other cast members, but um, a little self-effacing. I didn't see as much evidence of that in the original as I thought I remembered. So I really continually pushed the team to you know, explore those aspects of her personality. The same with Daphne. You know, Daphne was very much the damsel in distress in the earlier uh, incarnation, the original, and um, in fact, was referred to, I don't remember if it was on screen or off, but as danger prone Daphne. Um, and in my mind, Daphne had always been, you know, this, this lovely character who just completely embraced her girliness, you know, that 
she was as valuable a member of the team as anyone else because she had her own perspective on things and she would maneuver herself out of things with whatever she found in her purse, you know, and that sort of thing. Um, that wasn't as present as I remembered it, uh, but it was certainly something we amped up uh, in, the, in, in the new content. And the same with Fred. Fred was another one who I always thought of him as a big boy scout and he was very much the the straight man to Scooby and Shaggy's comic personas in the original. And so in later uh, content, we definitely played him up as, you know, incredibly earnest, incredibly well-meaning and, you know, quite literal in his approach to things. Um, it wasn't so much that he was the big brawny strong man as much as he was um, just sort of the, the, most straightforward on the nose guy um, that you don't want to meet. So again, just for me, the greatest joy was exploring these characters. Um, and we, I, I was able to do that with writers, with designers, with producers, with directors, with the cast. I mean, it was really, it was really terrific. And out of all the characters of the gang, did you have a favorite to help develop? Definitely Velma. Velma was always my favorite. She was my favorite when I was a kid. She was my favorite, you know, when I worked on the more recent content. Um, maybe I identify most with her because I'm, you know, a big nerd with a sarcastic sense of humor. Fair enough. <laughs> um, and on those first few uh, beginning movies, there were a few casting changes due to various circumstances. Were you involved in that process at all? Uh, yes, very much involved in the casting process. And in fact, um, uh, Mindy Cohn, who went on to play Velma for quite a few years, was, um, well, depending on who you ask, Scott Geralds and I debate about whose idea it was. But when we were talking about a replacement, um, I had said, you know, I it, in my head, I hear her as um, Natalie on Facts of Life. And then someone said, well, we should get Mindy Cohn. She's available. Um, so, uh, again, it, you know, everyone's everyone's memory differs a bit. But um, that was one that uh, I that's what I heard in my head. And that's uh, who we got. And I was thrilled because she really became. The, um, and then, um, you know, Casey Kasem is just phenomenal, as was Frank Bulker playing Scooby, Shaggy and Fred. Ultimately, we ended up, you know, Casey, I think, was having some health issues, um, and we ended up using a live action actor from the film um, for at least some of uh, the content, and he's, he was great. Then the, uh, the other person uh, I wanted to know was Gray Delisle, um, who has a different last name now, um, I'm forgetting her current last name, but she was Gray Delisle at the time literally was Daphne for me. I mean, she just had, I still hear her voice when I think of Daphne. I don't know if she's doing it currently, but boy, oh boy, did she do a phenomenal job. Where did the idea come from to, you know, both for the series and for the movies to have them, you know, traveling around the world? You know, it, it, it came from, from really this desire to, um, as I said earlier, to put Scooby and Shaggy and the gang in locations that would really lend themselves to animation, lend themselves to some sort of supernatural, you know, mystery of some kind. Um, and when we started going internationally in the films, it just opened up a whole new world. Um, it gave, you know, every film had a slightly different feel. Um, it gave us different costuming. Um, all sorts of different, you know, colorful characters. So it really was about broadening and you know, going beyond the, you know, sort of haunted mansion or cabin in the woods. And I wanted to talk a little bit about Scooby-Doo and the Cyber Chase, uh, as it's such a different movie from a lot of the other ones. Uh, where did the idea come from to put them in cyberspace? Interestingly, when that was first talked about, um, it was very much sort of a sci-fi fantasy. It was the first one I was doing from the ground up as a development executive. And um, it was coming off the heels of the Alien Scooby-Doo movie. And we wanted to do something with a video game. And at the time, you know, video games were huge. And 
Um, everyone was uh, obsessed with them. And so we kind of, the, the idea was how do we get Scooby and the gang into a video game and have them be all these different levels? Because not unlike, you know, your question about why take them all on the world, giving them all the different levels would kind of give them, you know, opportunities to be one moment, you know, in a contemporary baseball field, uh, baseball game um, park, another in, you know, the, the Jurassic period with dinosaurs and, you know, suddenly underwater. Like we were able to just go to all these different places within one video. And that was really a lot of fun. Um, and in fact, it was, it was one of the first ideas that the home video team got very excited about because they felt like it was tapping across it, not just Scooby, but what was hot in the popular you know, culture at the time. What was your favorite thing about being able to work on Scooby-Doo? My favorite thing about working on Scooby-Doo, honestly, were all the other people working on Scooby-Doo. I don't think there was anyone involved that wasn't an enormous fan of the original and um, didn't have truly a passion for the property, for its legacy, for its history. The show itself, the original show itself, meant so much to a whole generation of, of kids who were now all the people working on this show and on these these videos. And, um, you know, Joe Barbera at the time um, was uh, working out of our offices, first at Hannah Barbera and then over at the Warner Brothers offices. And, you know, to interact with him and to be a part of the legacy of such an incredible, such an incredible property um, was just an honor. But for me, from Joe Barbera on down, it was about everybody else, everybody else's passion and excitement. It was my, to date, it was my favorite thing that I've ever worked on. And what was it like to work on a franchise that, has so many different generations of fans. Were you thinking of maybe how to market to both kids and adults when you were working on the project? You know, we definitely would like very frequently, um, whether it was me or the producer or director or writer would try and give nods to the original and sort of little Easter eggs for fans. But you know, we were well aware that our primary audience was kids, kids today, many of whom you know, Scooby-Doo was relatively new. As you had asked in your trivia question, there had been no series for 11 years before the new content started. So um, it was, I think our, our primary audience was always the, the younger audience, um, but we wanted to stay, you know, uh, loyal to the, to the fan base that had been with it since the 70s. And out of the various Scooby projects that you worked on, do you have a favorite? Um, I do have a favorite, and uh, I, but my reasons for it being my favorite are not because it's necessarily the best or any better than the other projects, but Scooby-Doo and the Loch Ness Monster was a real passion project for me and for Joe Sitka, who was the producer-director on the project. It was really uh, uh, an opportunity for us to play together, and both having a passion for Scooby-Doo and for the Loch Ness Monster, it was... It was just a, a, a joy. Um, and it was the first time, I believe, that we used CGI in a Scooby film. The, the monster itself was CGI. And we mixed that with the 2D of the character animation and the rest of the film. Uh, and I think it went over pretty well. I look back on it, and of course, I see all the flaws and mistakes and everything else. But it was truly one of my, my fondest memories, and it'll always be special to me. More broadly, why do you think that a cartoon about a mystery-solving dog has had the staying power to keep going for over 50 years now? That's an excellent question. I have thought about this quite a bit, particularly when we were uh, bringing back the franchise into um, you know, films and television. I, th I think there's a couple of things at work. I think, number one... Um, no pun intended, but Scooby and Shaggy are sort of underdogs. They they succeed despite themselves. Um, that they they're kind of reluctant heroes that ultimately kind of rise to the occasion. I think that sort of underdog uh, protagonist really appeals to people. I also think that 
the, the ensemble of characters really makes a, a big difference that it's not just Scooby and Shaggy. It really is um, a group. And uh, there's sort of something in it for everyone, you know, that meaning different characters appeal to different to different people. And the fact that it's an anthology and it was you could never get tired of it because you never knew where they were going to go next or what they were going to encounter. And if audiences are anything like me, I love a mystery and you know, I can, I, mysteries are one of my favorite genres. Um, because it, it allows you to not just watch passively, but to be actively engaged in trying to figure out what's going to happen next. So for all those reasons, and the fact that it's just funny, um, I would say it, it's worthy of the endurance it's, 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 it's had. I think that covers all of the questions that I had for you. Is there anything else that you wanted to chat about at all, Scooby-Doo related? No, all I can say is I know, you know, Scooby is in the hands of some enormously talented people at Warner Brothers Animation right now. And, you know, the work that they're doing is absolutely beautiful from a production standpoint. Um, and I know that many of them share, you know, the same passion for the, the property and characters that, that I do. Um, and I just hope that, you know, it goes on for another 50 years because now as an audience member, you know, I still can't get enough. Uh, and just before we end here, do you have any recent projects you're working on that you'd like to promote at all? I, you know, I'd love to um, just share that at the moment I am working on a whole suite of content from Mattel Television um, of all different brands and properties. But the one I'm most uh, pleasantly surprised by and very proud of is all the content we're producing around the character of Barbie. I was not a, a real Barbie enthusiast a few years back. And since joining the company and really working with the creative team on, on the evolution of Barbie and Barbie's role in storytelling, I couldn't be more proud about where where we are now. Um, we've got a bunch of Barbie animated films coming out um, on Netflix. We've got one series airing there currently, another one in the works. We have um, a Barbie web series on YouTube called Barbie Vlogger. There's just all sorts of content now uh, in which Barbie herself appears as a character as opposed to Barbie playing a princess or a mermaid or a you know, astronaut, it's, it's Barbie, the 17 year old girl and her point of view on the world. And, um, she's come an awfully long way from the fashion doll that she was originally created to be. I encourage people to check it out because it's not the Barbie you think, you know, it's, it's Barbie for 2020. That's awesome. Uh, and do you have any social media channels or other places where people might be able to follow what you're up to? Um, I, well, Mattel.com and Mattel on YouTube. Uh, I don't personally have a social media uh, page. The only thing I have is a LinkedIn page. <laughs> I, I don't do any any social media otherwise. Perfect. No worries. Thank you so much for coming on the show today, Christopher. My pleasure. Thank you, Alexa, so much. And that concludes today's episode. Another huge thank you to Christopher Keenan for taking the time out to be on the show. And again, apologies for the slight technical issues on this one, but uh, hopefully you still got the gist of the content and it was still interesting for you guys to listen to. For more groovy content, be sure to check at Unmasked SD on Twitter, at Unmasked SD Podcast on Instagram, or at UnmaskedSDPodcast.com. You can also find the podcast on Facebook under the Unmasked History of Scooby-Doo podcast. If you liked this episode and want to hear more, also make sure to check those social media channels or the website. Or you can listen to older episodes wherever you like to get your podcast fix. Thanks for listening, and keep an ear out for the next episode. Scooby-Dooby-Doo!